Greetings. I'm speaking on a Sabbath near the time of the New Testament Passover, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, Communion, and also followed by the immediately followed by the uh, Festival of Unleavened Bread. So it's, it's a special time of year, uh, the first month on the ecclesiastical calendar, the spring, a uh, time of renewal, and uh, a time to uh, focus uh, uh, once again on the basics, basic understanding of uh, our omnibeneficent God and his plan for us. In the, uh, where we are in, in uh, the state of Florida, you know, we have to put our clocks ahead, spring ahead, fall back. That's the, the idea. And recently, we, uh, Linda and I took a trip to Paris, Paris, Texas. Yeah, we took a trip to Paris, Texas, but in driving there, we wound up gaining an hour driving there, but then losing an hour on the way back because we have time zones in America where we have the eastern time zone and the central time zone. Uh, I've been told that in China they don't operate that way, but it, to me it would be rather rather complex to to not have time zones. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm speaking in the morning on the Sabbath, and I'm back in. We're back home in uh, Central Florida, and today I want to talk about some basic understanding, very very important. Uh, a lot of people I think in in mainstream Christianity have a distorted concept of Jesus Christ. They don't think of him as as he is, you know, with with eyes blazing with fire and shining like the sun and coming to rule this world of king, as king of kings. He is, after all, the Christ, Christos. He's the Mashiach. He's the anointed one. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And when he comes back, it's going to be rather... Uh, uh, magnificent when he returns. Uh, I want to go to Revelation 19. <clears throat> now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head, on, on his head were many crowns. He had a name uh, writ, uh, written uh, uh, that uh, no one knows except himself. He was clothed with a, uh, with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And we'll say more about the blood that he shed for us in a moment. Uh, I want to uh, go on to, um, well, this next verse is, uh, well, I guess I'll just continue. Uh, and the armies in heaven clothed with in fine linen, white uh, and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, strike the nations rather, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he is... The lion, you know, he's symbolized by a lion. But we also remember, especially at this time of the year, that he was willing to be the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. That God, who is all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, eternal, that God was willing to become in the ministry of Jesus Christ, a fertilized egg in the womb of Mary to go through human existence and then to have it ended in, in a terrifying way to give his life, to suffer and bleed and die for us. But of course, then the man, the carpenter's son, the rabbi, was resurrected to immortal life, the first human being to be uh, so resurrected, resurrected to immortal life, and now is our, our living Savior, our high priest, and I just as I just mentioned, our coming king. But we need to remember uh, him always as also the lamb who sacrificed himself for us. And uh, the book of Revelation makes that very clear. 
it's it's basic understanding of God's plan of salvation that it involved the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I want to go to Revelation 13 and verse 8, and it says, talks about this tyrant who's coming to rule over the world before the coming of Christ. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written on the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. From the very beginning of human civilization, uh, it, it became necessary for uh, the word of God, the Logos, to become flesh and to uh, become a sacrifice for us. Perhaps even when the world was created, before even Adam and Eve fell, this was, in effect, you know, part of the plan. And when we go to the end of the story, we go to the uh, New Jerusalem. Uh, we go to the New Jerusalem. And um, the, uh, I wanted to talk about the fact that, uh, that there's no need for a temple in that city. Um, uh, let's go to verse 22. This is talking about the New Jerusalem. We're now at the end of the story. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty is its temple and the Lamb. I believe if you look at the Greek, you'll see that's how it's written. That's how it is. But I saw no temple, for the Lord God Almighty is its temple and the Lamb. And uh, you'll find also uh, that the uh, the Lamb is its night. Yeah, right, is its light. I'll keep reading. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Because Jesus Christ is both human and divine. <clears throat> so the Logos uh, is, is, uh, is God, as, as John says, but yet the Logos became human. So it's, it's, there's a lot of theology there that we can maybe go into at another time. But the, the, the point is that even when you get to the end of the story and God is ruling the world and Jesus Christ returns and the resurrected saints under Christ are ruling the world and Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords even in a fuller way because he's actually exercising that authority directly on the earth and creating the earth, creating a paradise here on earth. Even then, as we come to the end of the story, we remember him as the lamb, as the sacrificial lamb. We needed his sacrifice in order for us to ultimately be able to live because hanging over us all was the penalty of death, as we'll see as we go along. It's very basic understanding. When I want, The Apostle John, I believe, was the author of the book of Revelation, and it's written late in the first century, and very also very late, also late in the first century, I believe, is the Gospel of John. And I want to go back to the Gospel of John, and I want to go back to the first chapter where it's talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. He prepared the way for Jesus Christ. And uh, in uh, John 1, the first chapter of John, and verse 29, the next day John, this is talking about John the Baptist, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we all know John 3.16, which I'm going to review. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, the point is, if we're incorrigibly wicked, we're not going to be around. We're going to be dead forever if we're incorrigibly wicked. But if we repent and we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we can live forever, but not physically, but we can live forever on, on the spirit level. That's what God intends for us to be, his sons and daughters on the spirit level. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I want to go back to the 12th chapter of Exodus. Now, if we read the Bible, we can see a theme there in the Old Testament. If you read it objectively, you see a, a, a consistent theme combining the two Testaments. It's, it's clearly there to an objective reader. You look at Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac. You look at Isaiah 53, 
You look at the sacrificial system that permeates the Bible. Even Abel, in, in the, the, first, the you know in the, the first family, as it were, that, uh, that that is talked about in the Bible, you have Abel bring, bringing a, sac a lamb as a sacrifice. And uh, I want to, in fact, go all the way back to Genesis three and verse fifteen. And here you see, as God speaks to the serpent, uh, He said, "I will put enmity between you and the woman." between your seed and her seed so the woman of course in the in the bible symbolizes the church and say and the and uh, the serpent symbolizes satan and so people who are uh, connected to satan of course hate uh, god's church he shall bruise your head so ultimately satan is destroyed you know you bruise the head of the serpent then that's the end of the serpent and you shall bruise his heel uh, there was uh, Satan did have the the uh, opportunity to to wreak his hatred on Jesus Christ because that was part of God's plan. God allowed it. So uh, you could say that that the uh, that, that the heel was bruised in the sense that uh, he was temporarily ta uh, he was beaten up and temporarily dead, but ultimately he rose and his and the victory is God's. You know, and he shall bruise the head of the of the snake. So God is ultimately victorious, but yet, in His plan, it allows for uh, the you know the sacrifice of Christ. So we have really a messianic prophecy back there, and and actually, I probably turned away from there too soon. You find that uh, Adam and Eve did not were not successful covering themselves with fig leaves. That didn't accomplish anything. Uh, but uh, later on. It does say that um, that God uh, dressed them with uh, with skins. I'm going to go to verse 22. Uh, also, for Adam and his wife, the eternal God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So this shows that really the atonement for sin must come with with sacrifice. Obviously, skins come from animals that have been killed. So he made them skins. By the way, if you uh, fig leaves are very uncomfortable. So it shows that, you know, when human beings try to solve things, spiritually speaking, it doesn't work out. We have to solve things God's way. And he has provided for us, you know, in, in the Bible, the, the, you know, the step-by-step the, the step, uh, plan that, that, he, that he developed. And that is that he himself, you know, the, the word of God through, through whom all creation occurred and through whom all human beings were created, he, he takes responsibility for us because he created human beings. He takes responsibility for us, and so he pays the penalty for us. But he can only do it as a man, but he has to do it as a sinless man because if he sinned, then he would be subject to that penalty. So as a sinless man, he's innocent, not subject to that penalty. So he dies, but because he... He, uh, as the Word of God created all of us, he takes responsibility for us all, and he dies in our place. And, and clearly, the theme throughout the Bible is pointing to that. You know, as I said, the sacrificial system is so much a part of Scripture. And why, you know, you could ask, uh, why all these sacrifices? Well, they're pointing to the uh, sacrifice par excellence, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so he has obviated the need for personal sacrifices for people. You know, uh, in other words, uh, uh, under the New Testament, there isn't a need to bring for people when they sin to bring sacrifices. He is our sacrifice. But there is one sacrifice that we continue to bring in a certain sense uh, because it's so critically important. <coughs> Pardon me, because it reminds us of his role uh, in, in the plan of salvation. And that is the uh, New Testament Passover or Eucharist or communion. The Bible refers to it in, in 1 Corinthians 11 as the Lord's Supper. What we're doing there is taking symbols, bread and wine, and we believe it ought to be unleavened bread, uh, unleavened bread and wine as symbolic of his sacrifice. So we no longer literally bring a lamb and slaughter it, but we do have that sacrificial ritual in, a, uh, in the sense of having the bread, unleavened bread and wine, the bread symbolizing his body and the wine symbolizing his blood. And he wanted us to do that from year to year, 
Just as in the old days, anciently, God's people sacrificed a lamb, now we have that ritual uh, in place of the sacrifice. But it does keep us in mind uh, from year to year. You know, each year we, we honor, we memorialize the death of Jesus Christ on the day that he died, which is appropriate. If you know anything about Jewish culture, and after all, <coughs> the uh, Jews were the church of God at that time, Jesus came as a Jew to his people, and Jewish culture uh, honors great men by, by commemorating the anniversary of when they died. And this, of course, is what we do for Jesus Christ. We uh, commemorate the day of his death. And we do it at the beginning of the day. You know, the day begins in the evening. But more importantly, or, or also importantly, I, I, shouldn't, I don't want to uh, necessarily grade importance but i'll say this the sacrifice of christ was not just his death the sacrifice of christ really began with his betrayal he was betrayed he was arrested he went through all those humiliations that you read about suffered every kind of penalty that you find in scripture for uh, sin there's various penalties for sin and he he charmy he suffered them all and then finally gave his life and in an ignominious way, you know, he had thieves on either on either side of him, uh, and so uh, he and his sacrifice really began that evening uh, of his arrest, and so that's when we commemorate it, as Paul said in First Corinthians eleven. It's a clear instruction to uh, commemorate it on the night of his arrest. So if we go to Exodus twelve, we find that they were to take a lamb before they ever left Egypt, before. The revelation at Mount Sinai, before the ratification of the Sinaitic Covenant, before they ever left Egypt, this sacrifice was instituted. And so it persists even in New Testament times in another form. In verse 23 of Exodus 12, I think is where I want to go. For the Eternal will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel, and on the two doorposts, the Eternal will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. He sees the blood of the Lamb and passes over. You see, the th so as I said, if you read through the Old Testament, it all comes together in the New Testament. And they, they, they fit together you know, as one spiritual unit in three languages, yes. The languages of, of uh, uniting humankind. There are, in effect, from a biblical point of view, you could say three branches of humanity. We come from Shem, or we come from Ham, <clears throat> or we come from Japheth. And from Shem, we have the Aramaic language. You could look at Genesis 10. From Shem, we have the Aramaic language. Part of the Bible is in Aramaic. From Ham, we have the Hebrew language. It's a dialect of Canaanite. And so we have m most of the Old Testament, of course, in Hebrew. And then we have from Japheth, the Greeks, who gave, gave us the Greek language and the preservation of the New Testament. So it's preserved for all humankind in the three languages that, you know, in effect go back to the three sons of Noah. But the, um, I, the point is that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was for all uh, human beings. Initially, it was for the people of Israel, but as you know from the New Testament, and even from many verses in the Old Testament, God had planned to expand his plan beyond Israel to all humankind. As I just read that in John 3. And he goes on and says, And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. So that sacrifice, as long as we have the sacrificial system operating, that sacrifice is a part of it. And as I said, even now, we have a New Testament uh, form of that sacrifice, you could say. Because Jesus Christ, his death, obviated the need for us to bring uh, for ourselves uh, a, a physical sacrifice of an animal. But nevertheless, we do remember what he did for us by that commemoration, by that memorial service on the 14th day of the first month in the evening at the beginning of that day when he when he actually was arrested now he died however at the time that the lambs were slain 
At the time of Jesus Christ, the lambs were being slain at 3 p.m. And if you read the New Testament, uh, that's when Jesus Christ uh, died. He died around 3 p.m. on the 14th day of the first month, the, the day of the Passover the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. And uh, the next day was the first day of unleavened bread. It was a holy day, and it would, uh, I believe it. I believe it also was a uh, a weekly Sabbath. And maybe that's probably a subject for another day. Uh, but uh, of course, he rested on the on the Sabbath, and then in effect went back to work you know, on the first day of the week. Uh, the fact of Jesus' death and resurrection does not change, of course, the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day remains. Uh, Sunday is significant in a certain sense in that we have the Sunday during the Festival of Unleavened Bread was the time of the, of the offering of the wave sheaf. Just as we have before the Festival of Unleavened Bread, we have the Passover sacrifice. So during the days of unleavened bread, on the day we call an English Sunday, we had the wave sheaf offering. The sacrifice, the, the, the 14th day, introduced the festival, and that was the sacrifice, symbolized the sacrifice of Christ. The Sunday during the days of unleavened bread, the wave sheaf offering, of course, symbolized the resurrected Christ. And so it was the first fruits of the barley harvest, and it, it symbolized the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was resurrected during the days of unleavened bread. It's not a separate festival, but it is significant because it's the day then from which we count towards Pentecost. So we begin on a Sunday counting towards Pentecost, and Pentecost does occur on a Sunday. Now, Pentecost was when they offered the first fruits of the wheat harvest, picturing the first fruits of humankind, the resurrected saints. Now, we are not to know, if you read the Bible, we are not to know when Jesus Christ is going to return. But Pentecost was the time when uh, the, uh, in effect, official beginning of the New Testament church. And so we begin designating those who will rise when Christ returns, and they, are be they begin to be designated in an official sense on Pentecost. Pentecost, in effect, is the birthday of the New Testament church, and it is a New Testament church that will rise when Jesus Christ returns. I want to go to uh, John, the um, 20th chapter. John, the 20th chapter. And here we see uh, when Jesus first appears uh, to Mary Magdalene, um, Uh, let's go to verse 16 of John 20. Jesus said to her, Mary, right? Miriam, <laughs> Miriam. She turned to say to him, Rabboni, right? Which is to say teacher, you know, because they have to translate it because the New Testament is written in Greek and, you know, Rabboni is Aramaic uh, is or, uh, you know, Jew Jewish Aramaic, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Uh, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, uh, for I have not yet ascended, or you, it, it, it term is, is, works in Hebrew as well, I believe. We, we have the term Rabban, you know, like Gamaliel, who taught the Apostle Paul, we call Rabban Gamaliel, you know, like the gr Grand Rabbi Gamaliel. Anyway, uh, she turned to him and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So this is, he said that at the time they were offering the wave sheaf in the temple, the Omer of barley, that certain measure of barley. And, and that was because he is, he, he, he is in that sense, the first fruits, uh, because he was the first human being resurrected to immortal life. At this point, he's immortal. You know, he's both still, he still has a dual nature, but he's now the resurrected uh, man, and uh, he has to ascend then to his father. He's on the right hand now of his father, and he's interceding for us. So he was the antitype of the lamb, and the antitype also of the wave sheaf offering. Uh, you know, and then as I said, seven weeks later, we have the coming of the Holy Spirit, and so now we have the, the beginning of the process of resurrecting the, the saints to join him when he returns. And I want to go to um, 
2 Corinthians, the uh, fifth chapter and the fifth verse. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the, and the fifth verse. Now he who has uh, prepared uh, us for this very thing is God. You know, of course, I'm breaking into the uh, thought here. The thought here is that when you're resurrected, you, you, you don't have your physical body anymore. You have a spirit body. You know, you've exchanged your physical body for, for the spirit body, which, 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 which is immortal. Uh, you, find, you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> in fact, I'll go there first before I even read 2 Corinthians. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, if I may. I know you're already in 2 Corinthians. It's not that big of an issue. Flip back a few pages. Go to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians and go to around verse 21. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 21. And you'll see how, how the picture comes together here. For uh, since by, by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And this time my Bible capitalizes it because it's talking about Jesus Christ, the second Adam. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, and afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So first Christ was resurrected, and then the saints are going to be resurrected when, when he returns. Now if you look at uh, Exodus 23 and verse 16, and if you look at Numbers 28 and verse, uh, uh, and verse 26, Numbers 28, 26, you see that Pentecost or Shavuot, the festival of weeks, is the festival of first fruits. The Sunday during the days of unleavened bread, when the wave sheaf was offered, is not a separate festival. It's within the days of unleavened bread. The, the festival of first fruits is Shavuot, and that's when the completion of the first fruits offerings occurs. The barley harvest, first fruits are offered during the days of unleavened bread. The first fruits of the wheat harvest in parallel are offered during Pentecost. And you have the completion then of the first fruits offerings. And so Pentecost, if you ask any Jewish person, what's the festival of, f f of first fruits? It's Shavuot, festival of weeks, what we call Pentecost. It's called by the Jews Chag Habikurim, the festival of first fruits. And it pictures, as I said, the resurrected saints. But it doesn't mean that the saints are going to be, that Jesus Christ is going to return on Pentecost. As I said, Pentecost begins the process. We don't know when Jesus Christ is going to return. You don't know. Your pastor doesn't know. And I don't know when he's going to return because the Bible says we don't know. But we know he is going to return. He's promised. He is going to return. And, and the resurrected saints will rule under him. And this world will then become a paradise. So we're certainly looking forward to it. And we're praying every day, your kingdom come. And as in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 5, I'm finally going to go there now. <clears throat> now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a, <coughs> as a guarantee. So the Spirit comes to us as a guarantee of ultimate resurrection. And this can happen because we have a living Savior. He died for us, but he, he was resurrected, and now he lives as our uh, intercessor. And I want to go to 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and the fifth verse. Second chapter and... Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So now it is the, the resurrected immortal man who's also, you know, who has that dual nature, but he is our intercessor uh, with, with God. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of theology there, but uh, anyway, I wanted to read that verse to, to help us understand the picture. So this is basic understanding. God has a plan of salvation, and it involves uh, his becoming one of us and uh, going through what humans go through. And, for, and Jesus Christ, for a while, had to be head of a household. Uh, you know, his, his father evidently died. His mother was widowed, and there were uh, a, lot, a lot of brothers and sisters around. And so he it became a head of household. And he, of course, also had an occupation. And then, he be, of course, he became a teacher, you know, he, he experienced human life and the, the, ups, the uh, uh, ups and downs, as it were, but sinless. And then, of course, he suffered for us uh, uh, incomprehensibly, the suffering, and then died for us. But now 
He's, he lives for us, and he's our intercessor. So he's the lion, and he's the lamb. And I want to go to Revelation, the fifth chapter. Revelation, the fifth chapter. And here you see that John needs to understand uh, uh, the, the, the revelation that's been given to him, and he understands it through, through Jesus Christ. Um, I want to go to the fifth chapter of Revelation. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside on the books sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the, uh, or, and read the scroll or look at it. But one of the elders said to me, you know, he's having a vision of, 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 of heaven. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So from a human point of view, he comes from the royal tribe, from the royal line. He's Davidic, but he's Davidic and divine. So he's Jewish, but also he's divine. And, and, I, and I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. So this is a vision. It's not a photograph. It's a vision. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So here we have, even as we come to the end of the story, and we're, we have an end time prophecy here, we have, have the whole plan comes together in the, uh, and concludes, and we have the new heavens and new earth at the end of the book of Revelation. But still we remember, as I showed you earlier, earlier, that this lion of the tribe of Judah is also the lamb who had been slain. Now when, the, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So this incense that was offered during the sacrificial system was symbolic of the saints, of the prayers that, are, that go up. So we ought, obviously we ought to be a praying people. Uh, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, saying, so here these spirit beings are in effect representing us as human beings and singing to Christ, praising him for what for the plan of salvation that involves human beings ultimately becoming immortal. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, <clears throat> out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. You know, so representing human beings, these spirit beings, looking to Christ, who is really the, the key, you know, in, in, individual in, in God's plan of salvation. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and, and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on, and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all there that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the, then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. So this beautiful vision of John, you know, all creation, focusing on Jesus Christ, who is the, the uh, individual th through whom <clears throat> all human beings ultimately will have the opportunity for immortal life as sons and daughters of God. This is basic understanding. All the best to you and yours.